Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your one and only host, Eric Trexler. But today, for today's episode, I am joined by a very special, very temporary guest host named Greg Knuckles. Greg, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on. No problem. So, if you've been listening to the podcast, uh, we've had a little bit of a fireside chat series going on. If you haven't listened to those, they're very off-topic episodes, very laid-back, informal, and uh, not specifically about fitness topics per se. Um, today's episode is going to be a normal, you know, fitness-focused episode. So just wanted to make sure everybody knows what they're getting into today. Um, we're going to do a lot of Q&A stuff. As I've mentioned previously, we are falling behind on some of those Q&A uh, submissions that we get. Uh, if you're interested in submitting one for the future, you can go to tiny.cc slash SBSQA and submit your questions there. Uh, but yeah, we want to make sure you're getting your fitness content too. So that's why today is a normal episode. Uh, we do not have feats of strength this week, but we do have a good news segment. So, Greg, do you want to start out or should I? Ah, uh, you, you can take it away. All right. So the good news segment, the, the whole idea here is just to uh, start out with some good vibes. I stumbled across um, an article on the internet, um, and basically the idea is, I'll, I'll put a, a link to the article in the show notes here, but Google Arts and Culture has partnered apparently, with more than 2,500 museums and galleries all around the world. And the idea is uh, you can go to this, this website and basically tour a variety of, of different, uh, you know, really cool museums all over the planet. You know, high-resolution re images, the whole deal. And uh, I was kind of exploring it. You, there's, like, interactive tours you can do of these different museums uh, and even, like, uh, um, like cultural sites. Like I was looking around the, the Colosseum in Rome and I was looking like all over this stuff in Italy, like really cool stuff. Um, now I'm not what you would consider a cultured man. Uh, I'm a bit of a Philistine, but even I can appreciate the fact that um, this is a really cool feature. Like I said, super high resolution, super immersive experience where even from the comfort of your own home, you can explore these different, uh, you know, really cool art galleries and museums and even some historical sites as well. So um, if you're looking for, for stuff to do and, uh, and that interests you, I'll put the link in the show notes and you can go explore a bunch of museums that you've never been to. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, so for mine, th this is both something that in and of itself is, I guess, kind of good news, good vibes, and will also helpfully, hopefully help you cultivate more good vibes for yourself. So uh, Yale, the, the university, um, puts some of its classes online from time to time. Um, and often, like, you have to pay to take them online, and it's it's cheaper than what their normal tuition would be. Um, but they occasionally put some up for free. And so through Coursera, um, they recently put up one of their courses that is uh, colloquially known as their happiness course. The actual course title is The Science of Well-Being. Um, I believe it is their most taken online course, and it is currently open um, with flexible enrollment, if you want to take it for free, uh, you can, well, we'll put the link in the description if you want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, you can take it for free. Um, they say it, it will take approximately 19 hours to complete, give or take in total. So, you know, that's something you can do to, to chew up a lot of time. And, uh, the whole point of the course is to, I don't know, just, just help you build the skills and ability to be more happy and productive and just kind of chill and copacetic in general. Um, so if those are skills you would like to build, you can take this course online for free uh, and the link to do so will be in the show notes. Awesome. So let's get into some fitness stuff today. Uh, we've got a bunch of Q&A questions that we're, that we're catching up on here. Uh, why don't you hit me with the first one? You got it. So our first question is from Akeem, who asks, do you try to limit things like caffeine, artificial sweeteners, diet soda, or any calorie-free things either during a diet or a quote-unquote off-season? I've been trying to limit my overall intake of caffeine uh, and also trying to limit intake of diet pop, that is soda for everyone who doesn't live in the Midwest. Or Coke. Or Coke. Yeah. Where is it in the country where they call all soda Coke? I think it's like certain parts of the Southeast. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, oh, you want to hear a fun little fact about Coke? Sure. 
Okay, so um, there's a little town in Florida, and I'm blanking on the name of the town, um, but it has the highest per capita concentration of millionaires of any town in the country. And, and it's just like this tiny little rural town, I'm pretty sure. And the reason why um, is during the Great Depression, someone noticed that like, hey, most people are out of jobs, like their incomes have dried up. But the one thing that it's, it still seems like everyone is willing to spend five cents on to buy are bottles of cold Coca-Cola. And so this person had the idea that like, dude, like Coke seems to be recession proof at a time when nothing seems to be recession proof. Uh, I'm going to buy as much Coke stock as I can and tell everyone around me to buy as much Coke stock as they can. And so that kind of became like a cultural thing in this little town. It's just like, if you have any money, just pour it into Coca-Cola stock. And that was before Coke, you know, exploded and became a huge international brand. Yeah. And so, you know, those people who bought a couple hundred bucks worth of Coke stock and like just kept pouring all of their money into it, uh, you know, by the 80s or 90s, we're all millionaires. Dude, I, I saw an interesting thing about Coke. <laughs> we're taking quite a tangent here. I saw an interesting thing. Um, it's got an interesting history, like, like, like you're indicating. It's, it's been a, a fixture in American culture for a while now. And uh, I saw a cool television program that was following, it was kind of a game of cat and mouse between Coca-Cola and this person that was like way high up in the FDA. But um, it was so funny because they framed it as this like colossal showdown. It was like Al Capone and Elliot Ness, like mm -hmm. going after each other. And it's so funny because we look we look back at it it's something as benign as like Coca Cola tweaking their formula or whatever they were doing, mm -hmm. but dude, they were going at it with the U.S. government. It was like a big. There's huge lawsuits. It was crazy, dude. That's but, wild. But uh, anyway, continue with the question. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, Akeem has been cutting back his overall caffeine intake. Um, sometimes it feels as though I'm worrying about things that don't matter too much. Thank you for the advice. So to, to circle back to the question. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the longest question in the history of the podcast. It's yeah. been like six minutes. Yeah, yeah. So to circle back to the actual question, uh, Akeem is asking, is there a point in limiting caffeine intake or artificial sweetener intake either while you're trying to cut or during an off season when maybe you're trying to bulk? Yeah, good question. Um, so in general, I really don't have a lot of concerns about the popular non-nutritive sweeteners, um, even at pretty liberal intake levels. So if the question is like, hey, should I be really conscious about limiting those for some health or physique related reason? My general take on it is not really. Um, you know, th there have been several studies looking at a variety of different potential um, unintended consequences of high intake of artificial sweeteners. And I just really haven't been convinced that, that they are associated with anything that's particularly bad um, when it comes to actual causative links. Um, so I know I use the term associated there, but when you actually get down to it and look at well-controlled studies, they don't seem to actually be causing anything that's particularly unfavorable. Now, I mentioned, I specifically said the popular non-nutritive sweeteners that are currently out there. Um, one of the things to keep in mind when you're looking through that literature or articles about non-nutritive sweeteners is the one thing that they all have in common is that they're sweet as hell, <laughs> like really, really way sweeter than sugar. That's about where the similarities stop. These are very, very different compounds. And so that's why, you know, sometimes people will say, hey, I heard aspartame is bad for this or that. Does that mean sucralose is as well or stevia is as well? And unfortunately, these compounds are so different that any particular line of research you want to follow, you really cannot assume that what's true for one non-nutritive sweetener is going to be true for any other single non-nutritive sweetener. But in any case, you know, people have looked at the research saying, I'm concerned that non-nutritive sweeteners are going to cause weight gain or uh, cancer or, I mean, any, you know, going to cause me to eat more subconsciously, any variety of, uh, of different potential adverse uh, unintended consequences. And the non-nutritive sweeteners appear to be fine uh, for basically whatever you're looking into so far. Um, now, when it comes to caffeine, review papers on caffeine generally advise keeping your total daily caffeine intake 
under a limit of, you know, 400 milligrams, maybe 600 milligrams a day, depending on what paper you're looking at. You know, I have to be honest, I don't know where those numbers come from. I, I, I honestly think it's one of those things where somebody just kind of picked a number that they're like, come on, man, why are you going above 600? You know, like relax. But I, I, I can't really find any, it's one of those, those numbers, like the 400, 600 range. It kind of just started and then everybody says it now. I'm not actually certain how strong the evidence for that number is. Um, but in any case, if you look at a review paper, it's going to say 400 to 600 a day is where most people should keep the limit. And generally, it, It's kind of like the 220 minus age max heart rate formula. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people don't know that, but that number was kind of just like, eh, seems to work pretty well. Yeah. And then everybody went with it, assuming that it was kind of empirically derived and like a very rigorously uh, uh, determined number when in reality it was like, eh, that, that seems close. But um, in any case, yeah, a lot of times you'll see 400 to 600 and you, you can argue about whether or not um, that number was arrived at via robust or rigorous methods. I honestly have no idea where it came from, e even though I've seen a lot of papers use it. Um, but in any case, I do think much like the heart rate <laughs> equation, it, it tends to be pretty all right. Um, what I usually focus on is with your caffeine intake, if you're thinking about limiting it, the question is, are you getting jittery? Are you having sleep issues? Are you having headaches when you, when you use too much or too little in a given day? Um, or it has its effects just completely worn off uh, as far as you can tell. Whenever you start to get the wrong answer to those questions, um, you know, if you're feeling jittery, yeah, you're probably taking too much. If you're having sleep issues, uh, if you're running into headache issues, like th those are some of the telltale questions that can lead you toward deciding, I might be pushing it a little bit too far with caffeine. And something that we've talked about a lot in the past with caffeine and limits is the fact that caffeine metabolism and tolerance to caffeine is highly variable between people and even within the person, de depending on a variety of other health-related habits and nutrition-related intakes. So caffeine metabolism is too complex to boil it down to like, hey, everyone, here's your limit. But, uh, but those are some of the things that would make you think, yeah, I'm, I might want to start limiting things. But generally speaking, 400 to 600 is, is probably not a bad limit to just kind of use as your default, like null hypothesis, I guess. Like it'll probably work for most people. Practically speaking, I mean, Greg, I'm sure you know several, certainly no one in the room. I'm sure you know several people that... <laughs> That routinely have like 800 or 1,000 milligrams a day. I do know several people in the room who <laughs> routinely have that much caffeine. And it's like, it's one of those things where uh, when, I, when I decide to start capping my caffeine, it's because the answer to some of those questions I brought up previously, those answers are starting to plant the idea in my head like, eh, it's probably getting out of hand. But uh, specifically, the question was with regards to dieting. Um, so I kind of just answered in general there, but here's the thing about dieting. Um, if you are someone like me and in the normal off season, you're utilizing artificially sweetened uh, food and beverages, or you're utilizing a lot of caffeine, there's nothing wrong with that, but it does limit your ability to use those as tools late in the diet. And so what I mean by that is, a lot of times people get late into a diet and they say, I'm going to start consuming more caffeine because I'm tired and I'm lethargic and I, it might help with appetite a little bit. Um, but the problem is if you're already toward the higher end of acceptable caffeine intakes in the off season, it's probably going to limit your ability to actually utilize that and turn it into an actionable strategy late in the diet. You've basically already utilized it in the off season. So you can't kind of keep it as a card that you want to play for a little boost late in the game. Um, and I would argue that a similar thing can be said for artificial sweeteners. And so one of the things that I really like to do with dieting is utilize the easy stuff for as long as we can. And so the easy stuff would be, hey, you tend to have a sweet tooth and after dinner you like to eat something sweet. What if we swap that with something that's artificially sweetened? Um, and boom, that, that is a big calorie reduction that's going to be sustainable day after day. And it's a nice little, little trick you can play when, when your diet starts to get a little more restrictive. 
But again, if you're if you're already using that a lot in the off season, that there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But it it takes those uh, those strategies out of the playbook when it comes to trying to find easy ways to either uh, mitigate tiredness or maybe help with appetite or maybe make some of those really easy calorie swaps late in the diet. So um, if you're hoping to use caffeine or, or artificial sweeteners as a crutch later in the diet, um, then using them very liberally in the off season is going to impair your ability to really maximally utilize those strategies later in the game. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just it something to keep in mind is, is that if you haven't been using them in the off season, they can give you a nice little pick me up later in the diet. So that, that's the only real consideration to keep in mind when it comes to that particular question. And hopefully after hearing that answer, a lot of people are going to go read uh, and listen to podcasts about the wild history of Coca-Cola. Sounds good. All right. So um, is this question from the same person? I think it is. Uh, I didn't do that intentionally, but wow. we may have two Akeems that listen to the podcast. Yeah, it's spelled the same way, though. But but anyway, so Akeem asks, I, I'm assigning this to Greg. Um, he didn't specifically ask Greg, I don't think. But the question is, how much of a difference do steroids make for muscle growth? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to answer this question mostly because... Uh, several years ago, maybe like three years ago or so, um, I wrote a steroid series for Stronger by Science. And uh, I mean, I don't think any of the articles in that series were bad, but th there was like an inverse relationship between how good and useful I thought each article was and how many reads it got. <laughs> so the, the one that I was personally the least jazzed about uh, got the most reads, and the two I liked the most were were kind of duds. Um, so I kind of wanted to shout those two articles out because they're worth checking out, I believe. Um, and one thing I'll note on the front end, um, neither of us use or have used steroids. So if you're looking for... If you're looking for, like, a practical answer to this question of, like, oh, hey, I trained for this long and built this much muscle, and then I ran these compounds and built this much more muscle... Um, ask this to another podcast. Uh, so this is based purely off of one, what we have research to support and two, just what, you know, what we can see from competitive bodybuilders. Um, but you know, s stuff that like all of us would have access to, we can just go out in the world and look at it for ourselves versus, you know, personal anecdotes about the topic. Um, so anyway, the, the first article that I wanted to mention that I wrote several years back was called How Much More Muscle Can You Build With Steroids? So uh, it, it is basically a long answer to this exact question. And so here is the short version of the article to answer it. Um, first things first, it's going to be heavily dependent on what you use in all likelihood. So, you know, it, are you talking about you're running half a gram of test a week and nothing else? Or are you running, you know, like a full IFBB pro bodybuilder stack? Uh, those are both steroid regimens and they're both very different steroid regimens that are probably going to have, um, you know, very different effects on how much muscle you can build in general. So, you know, we're, we're already dealing with a fair amount of uncertainty based on, you know, what are you talking about using? Um, but in general, it appears that people over the course of a training career can build approximately twice as much muscle with steroids as they would have been able to build without steroids. Um, and so to make it clear, I'm not saying that people who take steroids wind up with twice as much muscle as people who don't, because um, that would be absurd. Um, but in terms of like where they started. So just to put some numbers on this, uh, we've talked about the fat-free mass index on the podcast before. We're going to use some of those figures as reference points. It appears for untrained males, uh, kind of an average untrained fat-free mass index number is somewhere around a FFMI of 20. Um, and if you look at studies that report fat-free mass index for n not like competitive athletes, but just kind of day-to-day -day recreational lifters, um, who've trained for a few years, 
it seems like the average FFMI that you see in most studies is somewhere around 23, give or take. Uh, and in the studies that report, you know, not IFBB pro bodybuilders, but, you know, just again, day-to-day -day lifters who use some gear during the course of their training, you tend to see FFMI numbers in the neighborhood of 26. So you're seeing a, a gain of about three FFMI points on average for just like recreational lifters and a gain of about six for people who use steroids. So that's about a twofold difference. Uh, and then kind of on the extreme end of the spectrum, so like how much, how much lean mass or fat-free mass do we see the absolute biggest drug-free people wind up with? And how much fat-free mass do we see the absolute freakiest bodybuilders who are on gear wind up with you tend to see fat free mass indices in the neighborhood of 30 ish for the biggest people without gear and fat free mass indices in the neighborhood of 40 ish for the biggest people with gear so again that's that's like a 10 point gain versus about a 20 point gain so again about a two-fold difference um so what I'm trying to say here is like a twofold difference in terms of the amount you gain, not necessarily the, the amount you end up with, uh, is a decent ballpark answer. But just to make it clear, it's an incredibly fuzzy ballpark. It's going to depend on what you're taking, how well you respond to gear, um, how effective your training was before you used gear in the first place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, somewhere around a twofold difference is... Is, is a pretty decent ballpark. Uh, and so this question did ask specifically how much of a difference do they make from muscle growth? But like I said, I wanna shout out another article that I wrote a while back, and, and this was the, the least read of the series, but was my personal favorite. Uh, if you're interested in how this relates to strength gains as well, and how much of a difference, a two-fold difference in muscle built across a career, uh, like what that's going to relate to in terms of how much strength you build across a career. Um, there's an article called The Steroid Strength Advantage, colon, A Theoretical Approach, um, which is both based on, you know, empirical evidence we have just based on what tested and untested lifters do lift. And then there's also some research uh, on competitive power lifters looking at what their total is on a per kilo of fat-free mass basis. Because essentially, the amount of muscle you have is going to largely influence how much weight you can lift. You know, you take gear, you build more muscle, that's going to help you lift more. Um, so we can we can model how large we would expect the strength difference to be as well. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in the answer on strength, which is quite a bit longer and would be probably quite a bit more confusing to try to explain if you can't actually look at the equations in the article, uh, you should check it out. Article again is the the steroid strength advantage, a theoretical approach. Uh, and both of those articles will be linked in the show notes. Good stuff. All right. Uh, next question for Eric is from Ben Salden. Ben asks, when experiencing strength loss when cutting, how can you tell if the loss in strength is a natural part of being in a caloric deficit or a result of overreaching? This is a really good question. Um, and, and a lot of people, especially if they're pushing their weight loss pretty far and getting pretty lean, a lot of people do expect some degree of strength loss uh, over the course of their cut. Um, so in, in many instances, it makes sense. So what I'm thinking of is, you know, you're an off-season bodybuilder, you're as strong as you've ever been, you're super bulked up, and you're about to get really, really shredded. We do expect that in many cases, there's going to be some strength loss there. And there's been a variety of case studies in bodybuilders that has lent support to that idea. Um, now, one thing you run into, uh, as the question is alluding to, is, you know, I, I would contend that bodybuilders are a bit notorious for overtraining uh, uh, or, or overreaching, I should say, especially during contest prep. Um, if you look at the convergence of factors, the high degree of, uh, of cardio getting added on to training. Uh, usually people are training like their life depends on it in the gym because they want to hold on to every ounce of muscle they possibly can. Um, people are obviously under eating. You know, they're in a caloric deficit and sometimes a pretty large caloric deficit depending on their approach. So there are a lot of factors that can contribute 
to overreaching. A another thing is uh, impaired sleep as you start to get leaner as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. And one thing you will want to consider throughout the course of, uh, of that type of a weight loss phase is, is it possible that overreaching is actually clouding my judgment of how things are going here? And so, of course, you could apply it to strength, like the question is asking. But another place I see this a lot is the question of, has my weight loss actually stalled? And the, the two questions kind of go hand in hand. They're, they're both, in some cases, overreaching related. So a lot of times, people that are in this type of a weight loss phase, their motivation levels through the roof, they are very, very focused. And... In, as an extension of that, they tend to be uh, a little bit tempted to skip deloads during their cut. It's probably a mistake. You still need deloads uh, in that scenario. In many cases, you probably need it more than you otherwise would. And so when people reach a point where their strength has fallen off a little bit and their weight loss seems to be plateauing, I would argue that that's kind of a perfect time to do a deload because you can test out exactly what's happening there. I know it's admittedly uh, challenging to do because it goes against your tuition. If you're really focused on a fat loss phase and you notice that body weight is not moving anymore and it should be based on your, your daily intakes and expenditures, the last thing that you would think is, you know what I should do? Take my foot off the gas pedal and just chill for a little bit. Um, but what I, what I encourage people to do is if you're in this, in this position, right, and you're trying to figure out if your lackluster strength performance or potentially a plateau in, in, in weight loss might be related to overreaching, do the deload. If those things are related to overreaching, a lot of times what I'll see with my weight loss clients um, is that we do the deload, body weight drops, we, we kind of have a, a flushing of, of kind of retained body fluid. Not, not a huge change in most cases, but you will see that the weight loss we thought was happening was happening all along. We were just retaining a little bit of, uh, of fluid. So in many cases, you'll see you do the deload, body weight basically corrects to where we thought it would be. There's a reduction in body weight, and we do see that performance in the gym uh, spikes a little bit. We, we, we see that, that uh, there was a little bit of masking of our strength because we were just not recovering well enough and, and kind of building up some of that fatigue and carrying it with us into the gym. So in some cases, you'll see that. And uh, like I said, body weight will drop, strength will come back closer to what we expected. And that's usually a good sign that you were overreaching a little bit and there's no harm done. That, that's okay. We fixed it. We did our deload. We should be good to go. Um, if, if you're noticing huge changes, that would mean that you were probably like really, really overreaching. And then you might consider actually saying, well, not only, maybe we haven't fully fixed it yet from this deload. Maybe we have to really reconsider how we want to approach this next block of training and, you know, see how long we want this deload to be. Um, but in any case, those are usually signs that over, overreaching has been uh, the culprit or at least a contributing factor. Um, now, let's say it goes the other way. Um, you are, you're thinking, okay, I think overreaching is going on here. You do the deload, body weight, stays pretty stable, uh, strength stays pretty stable, and it doesn't really seem to be moving. So even, you know, you stick with an, an entire deload, uh, however long that typically is for you, and you, nothing seems to be moving or, or budging or reacting in any way. If that's the case, it, it might be that you're looking at some real plateaus when it, when it comes to your strength performance and also your body weight. So that would be an indicator that you might need to uh, take a look at, at the training approach and the nutrition approach and uh, potentially adjust course because you're, you're clearly not happy with how things are going there. Um, now, if you're wondering, okay, well, is that normal? Like if it wasn't overreaching, why is my strength going down? Um, there are a, a ton of different reasons why you might notice those strength changes throughout a cut. Um, obviously, want, we want to minimize those as much as we can, but to some extent, there are a lot of circumstances where they're going to be likely, th those reductions in strength performance. So um, things that can contribute to that. One thing is just changing leverages. So if, if you're losing a significant amount of body fat, like you're going to notice that your your squats and your deadlifts and your bench pressing, they, they feel a little bit different as the actual like morphology of your body composition changes. So when you notice that your, your lifting belt is, you know, four loops tighter, 
I mean, you're going to feel different when you're squatting, when, when there's less fat around the joints, when, I mean, your body is literally becoming a different shape when, when you're taking on like really big fat loss goals. Those changes in leverage can be really difficult to get used to on the fly. And so those can, can certainly contribute. Chronically low glycogen can be a reality with, with, uh, with fat loss, uh, particularly if you're getting pretty lean and the deficit's pretty big. So chronically low glycogen obviously is not going to be fantastic for uh, cultivating strength or even maintaining strength in some, in some instances. Um, we've talked about in the past, there have been some really fascinating studies where even with, you know, it's certainly not complete glycogen depletion, but even with relatively small amounts of glycogen depletion, because of the, the way those glycogen stores are localized, we can actually see a, a, a pretty unfavorable hit when it comes to, uh, to force and power output of the muscle, even though glycogen is not fully depleted. And so, so that's something to keep in mind. We did get very speculative when we talked a little bit about passive tension in the muscle due to changes in cell volume, um, likely a, a kind of an extension of the glycogen thing. Um, very speculative. It was a fun conversation, but I don't, I don't think we really have enough to go with there yet. But uh, there, there, was, there, there was a cool study showing how changes in cell volume can alter some of the passive tension in the muscle. Wasn't that the study where they modeled it using an inflated condom? They did, yes, which fantastic methods. They're innovative folks. But, uh, but the, the, the general point here is there are a lot of things going on physiologically that could be contributing to these reductions in, in your strength performance in the gym. Some of them are unfortunately going to be really hard to fully mitigate or fully attenuate throughout the process. So as you're going throughout this fat loss, uh, you know, this phase of your training, you want to keep an eye on your strength. Um, you want to make sure you're still doing those deloads to try to assess whether or not you're just looking at poor management of your workload or if you are actually really losing some serious strength in the process. And if you're noticing that strength is dropping off really dramatically and deloads and, and you know, uh, changing some of those uh, those training variables to make a more um, a more suitable workload. If those things aren't really doing the trick and it doesn't look like overreaching is, is the culprit, you might want to consider some other aspects of your approach that might be contributing to those reductions in strength. If I can add something as well. Sure. Um, so of the powerlifters I've coached who've tried to move down a weight class. So like, I, obviously what I'm talking about here wouldn't apply to someone who's you know, 12% trying to get to 6% or something like that. Um, but pretty commonly when people try to move down weight classes, they do get a little bit weaker in the process. And people who are really focused on strength and performance often have kind of a tendency to catastrophize relatively small strength losses. So, you know, there's a weight that you used to be able to do for five and now you can just do it for three and like, oh shit, it feels like the sky is falling. One of the things that helps um, if you're, you know, primarily focused on performance and you're trying to lose weight is keep tabs on both how strong you are in an absolute sense, but also how strong you are in a scaled sense. So, you know, if you're competing in powerlifting, Maybe you compete in a federation that uses Wilkes points. Maybe you're competing in a fed that uses IPF points. I'm personally very partial to just allometric scaling, but you know, use some sort of formula that takes both strength and body weight into account. And if you see that your strength is dropping off, but in a way that isn't, isn't in a way that's, that is disproportionate to how much body weight you're losing, such that you are losing more body weight than would be expected given the strength loss, then you're still in a pretty good place. So uh, that was a wordy way of saying, if you're losing weight, your strength is going down, but your, Wilk your Wilkes points are going up, you're, you're doing pretty well. One, just in terms of the objective of becoming a more competitive power lifter, you'll probably be more competitive in your next meet, which is good. Um, and two, you know, some degree of strength loss should be expected, but if your Wilkes points are still going up or maintaining stable, um, you know, you're, you're probably not cutting too fast and losing too much strength, even though you may be losing a little. Another thing you can do, which doesn't really, 
isn't like super helpful for for lower body assessments but can i think be pretty helpful for you know seeing am i maintaining strength and performance of the upper body pretty well is just like from time to time do a rep max of body weight pull-ups and dips and if you are maintaining the number of reps you can do that's not great but that's pretty good if the number of reps you can do is going up then you're probably in a pretty good spot if you're seeing that your body weight's going down and your maximal number of reps to failure with body weight pull-ups and body weight dips is also going down, that then indicates to me that you're you're experiencing disproportionately large strength losses. Um, so that that's a pretty easy practical test you can do to see like you know are are these drops in strength that I'm seeing more than less than or about equal to what I would be expecting? Yeah. Yeah, th- those are really good additions for sure. Okay, next question uh, is from Drew. Question is, I've been squatting uh, two or three times per week for the last year. Is it reasonable to expect to continue progressing while only squatting once a week? Um, how should I structure it to get the most out of it? Yeah, sure. So I think it is perfectly reasonable to continue making progress. Um, I-, I think that So frequency, I think, had its big moment maybe three years ago um, when, like, super high frequency stuff was very, very chic and people were were acting like frequency was the main and the most important variable for getting stronger. Um, And and I think that, that people have kind of largely settled on, like, yeah, hey, frequencies greater than once per week are probably good, but anything beyond like two or three times per week probably isn't magic. Um, But both like practical experience and scientific evidence at this point does point towards, you know, frequencies per muscle group or per movement of two or three times per week probably being a little bit better than a frequency of just once per week. Um, However, that does not then mean that you can't make progress with a frequency of just once per week, just that you probably would make progress a little bit faster if you did keep your frequency a little bit higher. Um, But, you know, B is slightly better than A does not then mean that A is completely ineffective. Um, And and another thing to just consider and think about, um, and, and this is something that you always kind of have to keep in mind if you're looking either at competition results or scientific data, Uh, so, you know, you're reading a training study and it says like, oh, people did this and they got 20% stronger and people did this other thing and they only got 12% stronger. Therefore, thing one is better than thing two. One thing that we don't know is whether that purely relates to kind of like short-term rate of progress or whether that does actually relate to where people will eventually end up after years and years of training. And I kind of think that for for some things, uh, it is going to make a really long-term impact, and for some things, it won't. And so for volume, for example, if you're comparing, you know, say, two cohorts of people training for 20 years, and one of them only ever does five sets per muscle group per week, and another does, say, 10 or 15, I think that after 10 or 20 years, the group doing... 10, 15 sets per muscle group per week will probably wind up with more muscle and more strength than the group that, you know, kept volume really low the whole time. However, with frequency, I'm not sure if I do actually think it matters that much for long-term progress. Like, I I think that it may, but only a little bit, but primarily it just affects rate of progress in the short to moderate term. Uh, And one of the reasons I think that is uh like i've been around powerlifting for a while now and i know how just training trends have changed and developed over time and until fairly recently um pretty low frequencies were the norm so you know you were training each lift once a week or maybe twice per week and the maybe twice per week was mostly bench press um so most people would squat once per week deadlift once per week and bench press twice per week um, or something like that, or, or if they trained squat or deadlift twice, generally the, the second day was just kind of like a lighter, like accessory or like active recovery day. So like that, that's how most people were training, you know, let's say 10 years ago, give or take 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so one of the things you can do, 
uh, is you can pull up Open Powerlifting, download their data set, and look and see how lifter performance has changed over time. And I, I think this is something we've talked about on the podcast before. There is kind of the belief and understanding that training practices have gotten better over time, and that's the reason we're continuing to see stronger and stronger lifters and world records continue to fall. Whereas I think, you know, world records continuing to fall is primarily just a function of the sport getting bigger. And, you know, when you're dealing with a larger sample size, like a larger population pool, if you're looking for outliers, your odds of finding a bigger, or big, like a bigger and bigger outlier gets, your your odds get better and better as just the, the total sample of competitors gets bigger. Um, and so I think that's pretty much what's going on because when you look at how like the mean and standard deviation of lifter strength changes over time, it's pretty much been the same for, for as long as we have reliable data. Um, so, you know, if you go back and look and see, oh, how we're, like what were people lifting? Like what were their Wilkes points or just what were they lifting in an absolute sense in 2010? It's pretty similar to what they're doing now. Like the average lifter hasn't changed all that much. Uh, the overall like dis dispersion of performance hasn't changed all that much in terms of standard deviations. Um, there's just, you know, 10 times more lifters in the sport. So we're seeing better and better people at the very like upper class. Um, and so relating to frequency, like I was saying before, I know for sure that the average frequency with which people train each lift has changed over those 10 years. Like I'm, I am positive of that, uh, but we don't actually see that being reflected in huge differences in how the average lifter performs. Um, so yeah, I, I do think going back to the question, which was just asking about squat frequency, I think if you drop from a frequency of two to three times per week to a frequency of once per week, you'll you'll probably wind up about the same place that you would have before. You'll probably keep making progress. The progress will just be slightly slower. Um, and in terms of how you structure that, you know, that's going to depend on your entire training program. Um, so it's hard to give a quick and easy answer to that question. But the one tip I would give is, you know, if you're collapsing two or three, two or three squat sessions into just one session, I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking all of that volume and just doing it all in that one session. So, you know, if you were doing 15 sets spread throughout a week, I wouldn't recommend doing 15 sets all in one session. Like that's probably going to be absolutely ludicrous. Um, but I would recommend overall volume for that one squat session be higher than what your average squat volume per session was with a higher frequency. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say, I would say in general, you probably wouldn't want weekly volume to drop by more than about 50%, give or take. Um, but, but that's probably a decent place to start. So you know, whatever your per session volume was in those two or three sessions per week, bump it up maybe a set or two from there. See if that's working for you. See, see if that's allowing you to make progress. And if not, maybe bump it up a little bit more after that. Um, so that, that's the biggest thing I would recommend. Do you have anything to add? No, I, th I think you're right. Um, it, it's been interesting to see, uh, you know, I first started getting into the fitness stuff, I don't know, when I was like 12. Mm -hmm. But even up till the age I was like 20, it seemed like everybody was doing what would now be considered really low frequency stuff. Um, but but man, the, the last few years, the, high, the, the pendulum kind of swung way in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you know, can I get away with only squatting four times a week? You know, it's, <laughs> it's been interesting yeah. to see. Uh, but no, it, it is... Uh, it's nice that we have the kind of flexibility that we, that we enjoy, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you can make a lot of different training frequencies work as long as you're managing the other factors effectively. So no, I, I, I totally agree. All righty. So next question for you is from Randy. Randy asks, I've heard meal timing throughout the day is fairly inconsequential, but does the literature show any meaningful benefits of having higher calorie workout days and low calorie rest days? So basically the idea of calorie cycling um, and he's asking this specifically for limiting fat accumulation. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, 
I'm not familiar with uh, with any research directly looking at that, like specifically training days and non-training days. It could be out there, but I, I personally haven't seen it. But, uh, you know, we, we could certainly use similar literature to make some, some uh, extrapolations and some inferences from that. But I kind of prefer to just kind of logic my way through it. Um, and to do that, you can kind of set up an even more extreme example. So if you wanted to, you could take this to an even more granular level than just saying, you know, should we manage our intake and expenditure, you know, from rest days to, uh, to workout days and kind of make sure we're matching those things up. Uh, so the idea would be that because your work, because you're theoretically spending less ener energy on off days, you should then scale your intake accordingly to make your, your 24 hour energy balance line up better. Um, but to put that on a 24 hour time scale, as far as I can tell, is a, a totally arbitrary uh, decision. So if you wanted to, you could take it even fur even farther and get more granular with it and say, um, why should I be eating meals, which are a large bolus of energy intake uh, for the for the couple hours during and following that meal? I'm in a huge energy surplus. Uh, you know, what I should be doing is just kind of spacing those bites of food throughout the day and making sure that I'm keeping a more consistent influx of energy. And so it, you, you could make extreme examples like that and say, we could really drive ourselves crazy trying to manage this day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, uh, you know, balance of intake and expenditure. I think a much more intuitive approach is to just let it go, to just understand that you know, there are, there are temporal aspects of, of nutrient timing that matter, right? So the general concept of, you know, having at least a bolus or a couple boluses a day of protein, for most people, I generally recommend, you know, somewhere between three to five, three to six uh, protein meals per day. Um, I think that's the safest bet, but, you know, we could certainly understand that there is some time-related aspect of protein timing uh, or protein intake. We don't want to have all of our protein, you know, every 14th day. If we go to extremes, we understand that protein should be spaced better than that. But when it comes to energy balance, when it comes to balancing the intake and the expenditure of just energy units, we really have to play the long game. You know, micromanaging the hour by hour, day by day aspects uh, really don't seem to be super helpful when it comes to limiting fat accumulation or facilitating fat loss. Um, and when you look at, you know, even some related strategies, uh, so you might you might say, well, what, what if we look at the alternate day fasting literature or, uh, you know, different types of intermittent fasting where, uh, the total caloric intake per day really changes from day to day. Over the course of several weeks of dieting, do we see really large benefits of taking that approach? Not really. There have been a few really good meta-analyses looking at, you know, the, the time-restricted feeding approaches that, or I should say intermittent fasting approaches that, you know, for, for at least a couple days out of the week, you have really low intakes. Um, it just doesn't seem to, bat to matter that much. What really seems to matter is over the days, the weeks, and the months, are you consistently in an energy surplus or an energy deficit? Um, within, those, uh, within those guidelines, obviously you wanna make sure you have sufficient protein, you wanna make sure it's timed in a reasonably sensible way. I would say bare minimum, at least have a couple protein meals per day. So even if you're on a pretty limited time window for feeding, let's say you do like, uh, let's say you do a 20 hour fast every day. So your time window for eating is only four hours, have protein at the beginning, have protein at the end. I'd say that's probably the bare minimum you'd want to do uh, when it comes to protein timing, but I'm really not super interested in managing, you know, really micromanaging the day to day flux of energy and the, the somewhat related literature we could lean on to try to make inferences would suggest it's probably not that big of a deal. Now there are. Can can I add something in here real quick? Sure. Yeah. So I, I don't have the references on hand, but I think one of one of the places where this idea got started um, is I've come across a couple studies from not like a super long time ago. We're not talking like classics from the fifties or sixties, but like I think one of the papers was from the mid nineties, and the other was from the early two thousands. Uh, but one was on track and field athletes, and the other was on gymnasts. And they were looking at 
like hour by hour energy balance and body composition. Yeah. And they found that the in both of these studies, they found that the athletes who were in a calorie deficit for a larger percentage of the hours of the day tended to have higher body fat levels than the people who were were closer to maintenance or at maintenance for a larger proportion of the hours of the day. And so that I think then spawned the idea of you know, you need to make sure that you're eating more on training days and certainly around training sessions so that you are not too catabolic, which then may kick in fucking starvation mode or whatever and make you hold on to more body fat. When, as you mentioned, when we actually look at longitudinal studies where you randomize people into groups and you can actually draw causal inferences, we see that these different patterns of like, do we fluctuate calories or do we not? doesn't really seem to matter all that much. And so the the much more likely explanation of those studies, which I think helped, if not spawn, at least lend some degree of, of the appearance of empirical support to, to this concept, the much more likely explanation is just that the athletes who had higher body fat levels were trying to diet and were therefore in a deficit for more hours of the day. Um, so anyway, if, if you were asking this question with, some of that research in mind, I think the much more likely explanation is just, yeah, the, of course they were in a deficit for more hours of the day. They had more body fat. They're competitive athletes. They were probably trying to cut versus the fact that they were in a deficit is what made them have higher body fat levels. Yeah. I, I also wonder if there is the possibility that uh, there could have been some compensatory eating. So it's like you were in a deficit for more of the day, but when you did eat, you kind of over compensated. Mm-hmm. Do you know if they looked into that at all? Uh, I don't remember. I, yeah. I haven't read either of those studies in at least five years. Yeah. But, but, it, but, but I, I do know that like, so this was a concept that I used to like completely buy into. Like I, yeah. I, I went through, you know, I went through a phase where I thought like keto was the best thing where I thought intermittent fasting was magic, like blah, blah, blah. Like I, we've talked about this before. I, we, we both went through, kind of like extreme dietary phases as I think most people probably have at some point. Yeah. Um, but I remember like when I was kind of on the kick of like carb cycling and calorie cycling is super important. Those were the studies that I would see people cite a lot. Uh, and I didn't understand research methods well enough to know that there were probably better interpretations. So like you said, could be a compensatory eating thing could be, like I was saying, kind of the same thing as like they find higher body fat percentages in people who consume Diet Coke. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're trying to cut calories because they have higher body fat levels. Um, so anyway, just wanted to kind of slot that in because I, I do still I do still see those studies cited from time to time. Yeah. And also, you know, I, I haven't seen those studies. Uh, I, I'm I'm aware of the concept. I've heard of them, but I haven't read them myself. But if they're if they were making those assessments based on self-reported intakes then that opens up an entire additional can of worms in terms of potential confounders you know mm-hmm. what i mean so um I, i'm gonna go seek those out after we record this uh, and take a look at those studies but the, the the important thing in terms of the take-home points is that in the studies where we do actually rigorously control the variability of intake from day to day like you mentioned uh, the more rigorous, more uh, more controlled studies would indicate that those day-to-day flu- fluctuations, when we look at the longitudinal outcomes, they tend to basically get kind of washed out over time. They, you know, they, they smooth out, and what we really tend to see is uh, the main driving factor there is over this, you know, eight-week, ten-week, whatever it is, over this period, what was your overall, uh, you know, energy balance? Were, were you under eating enough to actually induce weight loss is really the the deciding factor there. Um, now there are some instances where you might consider um, what what I call nonlinear um, dietary approaches. So um, there, I'm I'm not saying that everyone should eat the exact same amount every single day always. Um, there are some uh, applications, some reasons why you might consider doing some fluctuations day to day. The first one is you like it that's fine. (laughs) It'll be fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in terms of like a real targeted approach, um, you might want to, if you're on a calorie restricted and, um, you know, carb restricted diet, 
you might consider trying to sneak some carbs closer to workouts, kind of stacking them, uh, particularly if there's a like one or two workouts throughout the week that you really want to make sure you've topped off your glycogen before you head into the gym. It would make sense to put a couple high carb days in there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, a lot of different potential uh, refeed or diet break strategies in the past. Um, the, the research on diet breaks and refeeds, um, it's kind of in its infancy. I, I don't think we really fully understand exactly how efficacious they are in the real world in practical settings. There are a few studies indicating that they, they seem to be promising. Um, I do fear that sometimes I let my excitement about the concept uh, sound as if I'm more confident in them than I should be. Um, I, I do think that they're a promising concept, but, uh, but there, there's still a great deal of research to be done when it comes to figuring out, do those types of refeed and diet break strategies actually really yield better results over time in terms of body composition? There absolutely are studies suggesting that's the case, but I, I don't think it's, uh, I, I think we still have a lot more to learn about whether or not they really are when we really tightly control for energy intake and adherence. Um, and another thing that, that we have to figure out is if these strategies do work, these diet break and refeed strategies, how long does this uh, need to be? Does it need to be a two-day refeed, a three-day refeed, a two-week diet break? There's a lot that we really don't understand yet. And I think what's important is if you're utilizing those refeed or diet break strategies, th there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is some promising stuff and I'd like to implement it. And I think it, you know, there's enough there to at least give it a shot. Um, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But uh, it, it's really important that as we get more research, I know of at least a few studies that should be coming out in the next few years, just based on like pre-registered trials and stuff like that. I do anticipate that we are going to learn a lot more about them in the years to come, which is going to be exciting. So it's really important, um, you know, to, to keep an open mind about as that literature develops, really revising, you know, our understanding of, of how we might use some of those nonlinear dieting strategies. So um, working toward a summary statement here, um, I don't think you need to worry about your day-to-day -day energy balance. I, I don't think you need to worry about oh, on my off days, I burn 200 less calories or 200 fewer calories, so I need to eat less on my off days. I think that's a level of micromanagement that is not necessary and, if anything, might be a net negative just based on your sanity. Now, if you prefer to have nonlinear intakes just because it suits your preferences, you're not losing anything there. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking that approach. Um, now, if you're going for a, a particular targeted nonlinear strategy, such as stacking carbs near a particularly important workout, maybe implementing some refeed or diet break strategies, depending on how you structure that, you could argue that there are some benefits there. So uh, the, the important thing is just kind of the, the caveat, which is that all those potential benefits of using those nonlinear strategies there's promising research there, but I wouldn't say that it's conclusive research. I think we still have a lot to learn about exactly how to structure diet breaks and refeeds and where they may or may not actually be effective. Makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, Greg, question for you. Uh, this one is from Vic. What's the latest on strength and isometrics? Uh, given gym closures and my limited home equipment, I'm thinking of using isometrics to help maintain strength on the squat bench and deadlift? Yeah, so uh, first thing I'll say regarding isometrics is unfortunately, it may be challenging to optimally use them if you're like in home quarantine or your city's under lockdown. Uh, reason for that is the isometrics that appear to be the most effective are ones that you perform them with a ballistic intent. So you try to produce as much force as you can as quickly as you can. And uh, you basically exert as much force as possible. So for example, if you were in a gym and you put the safety pins at around knee height for the deadlift and you had a bar that was under the safety pins and you were just trying to pick the bar up as forcefully as possible into the safety pins in a deadlift-like motion, um, that would be a very effective isometric, uh, especially if you kind of like got the bar flush with the pins but weren't exerting much force yet. 
and then very ballistically tried to get to max force as quickly as possible during that isometric. Um, that is the style of isometric that seems to be the most effective for promoting strength gains. Um, and unfortunately, that is kind of challenging to do if you're, you know, trapped in your apartment or your house. So uh, a, a very classic isometric you can do is you can do isometrics with absolute maximal force and ballistic intent in a door frame for your side delts. You can just have your arms down at your side, put the back of your hands against the door frame and push out as hard as you as hard as you want. You know, you can exert maximal force with your side delts that way. That's great. Um, something like a squat is going to be a little bit more challenging to rig up uh, if you wanted a way to do kind of like maximal force isometrics. Um, the, the type of isometrics that people do do sometimes where, you know, like let's say you're in a push-up position and you just hold kind of a half push-up position isometrically, it's not that it's it's not going to do anything. That's just not the most effective way to do isometrics. Um, and those would probably be most of like the isometrics you'd be doing in, in a home lockdown scenario. Now, something you could do is if you have a car, um, you could just like pull really hard on the back bumper of a car like a deadlift. That, that actually would be pretty good. Um, so in general... If it's kind of, if you're doing sub-maximal isometrics where you're just holding a, a position until you get tired, um, that doesn't really seem to be any more effective than, say, you know, doing push-ups through a full range of motion for just, like, actual reps. Uh, and just the regular push-ups probably would be more effective than just the isometric push-up holds. But if you can do kind of, like, maximal force ballistic intent isometrics, those are quite good. Um, and in terms of how they work, they seem to strengthen joint ranges of motion within about 15 to 30 degrees in either direction of the joint angles that you're actually training isometrically. Um, so, you know, for example, if you were doing isometric quarter squats, that's, pro that's probably not going to really help you with strength out of the hole. Whereas if you're training a squat somewhere around your sticking point, um, that will probably help you get stronger in the hole and a little bit above your sticking point as well. Um, so yeah, 15 to 30 degrees joint range of motion on either on either direction of what's actually being trained. Um, I think that in general, that style of isometric is at least in theory a good complement to like quote unquote normal training. Um, because there's no eccentric component to it. So we know that it, it will help induce strength gains, but it's not going to induce nearly as much muscle damage as like quote unquote normal training because there's no eccentric component. Um, you could theoretically do concentric only training to get, you know, also benefits without as much muscle damage and probably make it a little bit easier to recover from. But concentric only training is logistically quite challenging to set up unless unless you have specialized equipment or a very, very understanding partner where, you know, let's say you you're doing concentric only bench press, you bench press the weight up, you know, your your spotter takes it, you take your hands off the bar, they lower it down to your chest, you push it back up again. In theory, that would be great. Uh, there are actually machines that I've seen used in research contexts before that, that allow you to do that, but, you know, you're probably not going to be able to do that in most gyms. Um, so yeah, I, I think they can be a good complement for normal training. One of the benefits of them is that, like, like I said, you can train specific ranges of motion, and so it can be highly, highly specific for training weak points. So, you know, you're, you know you're the weakest an inch off your chest in the bench press, you just get in a power rack, you set the pins where, you know, you're pressing the bar into them when the bar is about an inch off your chest. You can just push against those pins as hard as you want. That is training that specific weak point in the range of motion. That is great, highly specific training. Um, and uh, another, at least research-based benefit of isometrics is that isometrics performed at long muscle lengths seem to be pretty good for hypertrophy. So there was there was a meta-analysis on this that came out, uh, I think about a year ago, which we can link in the show notes, um, where 
they basically, well, they looked at a lot of different aspects of isometrics, but one of the things they looked at is isometrics performed at long muscle lengths versus short muscle lengths and the impact that they have on hypertrophy. Um, and isometrics performed at long muscle lengths seem to be pretty effective for hypertrophy. So if you were doing isometrics to, you know, specifically try to strengthen a weak range of motion in one of the big three, those weak parts of the range of motion tend to also be at relatively long muscle length, so near the bottom of a squat, near the bottom of a bench. Uh, and so if you were doing isometrics to train the weak points in those lifts, you're going to be putting yourself in positions at, at relatively long muscle length, so you're probably going to get some sort of hypertrophy effect as well. Um, again, I, I think it's probably not going to be quite as effective for hypertrophy as like a standalone standalone modality as just like quote unquote normal training would be. Um, but as you're doing dedicated weak point training, there probably will be some sort of hypertrophic benefit as well. Um, one thing I will say about isometrics though, is I don't feel comfortable giving too much advice on just like nitty gritty implementation because while there's a fair amount of research showing that they work pretty well, I don't know that many people who actually use them in practice. Um, and I also don't know, so it's that I don't know many people who have ever used them often in practice. So it's not one of those things where like science found something, coaches were like, oh, this seems pretty cool. Let's use this with our athletes. And they found that it just didn't work in a practical setting. It's just that like not many people do a ton of isometrics in training period and kind of never have. Um, <laughs> I, I know I've been interested in isometrics for a while, and despite that in, that interest, I have never done many. And I think part of that is, like, they're kind of boring. Um, you know, I like picking up heavy things. I like throwing heavy iron around. I know that I can exert just as much force, if not more force, into an immovable object. But it's just not as fun as, as throwing heavy shit around. Um, so I don't really have that much advice in terms of like nitty gritty like here's how often you should do it here's how long each isometric should be like here's how many total isometrics you should do per week like I don't have good guidelines for that I don't know of good guidelines for that from like a practical perspective just because I don't know that many people who have actually done them uh, but if you want to play around with isometrics like I said there's a fair amount of research supporting their efficacy it's something that I'm interested in, but have never done and maybe will never do. So if you want to play around with isometrics and report back to me with your experiences and results, I would be very interested to hear about it. Awesome. I think we got time for one more question. So I'm, I want to answer this question from Jimmy because I think it's a really good one. All right. So Jimmy asks, Eric has mentioned a couple times that he's gotten down to 1500 calories during prep. Other than copious amounts of shredded chicken, what would be the most nutritionally complete 1500 calorie meal plan or what would the most nutritionally complete 1500 calorie meal plan look like? Yeah. So this is a good question because I think a lot of people, um, who unfortunately have to consume low calorie, uh, diets, you know, if you're a smaller person or if you're just really, you know, tend to be resistant to, to weight loss or, you just don't have really high activity level. So you got to really push the calories low. A lot of times people get toward the end of a diet and they're like, it, it's not just that this is unpleasant, but I'm concerned that I'm not meeting my needs as a human being. Like I'm just out of stuff here at the end of the day. So how do I actually make this work and ensure that I'm getting enough nutrients in to actually support my health? Um, and, and so, you know, I've been in preps where it, I, I tend to, be very open about this. I hate cardio. I don't like doing it at all. And so if, if for me, the choice is between like kind of starving versus like, oh, you can eat more, but have some cardio in there. I'm just going to starve like <laughs> 10 times out of 10. And so I don't really mind the low calorie thing, but it is a logistic, a logistical challenge is if, if I'm pushing my calories that low, how do I make this work? And obviously the first part is going to be lean protein sources. I think that's extremely obvious, but when you're selecting your lean protein sources, something to keep in mind is, can I find some lean protein sources that also happen to have micronutrients in them as well? And so a, a variety of lean protein sources can be utilized, some of which having more, more micronutrients than others. 
Um, but one of the really key things when it comes to making these low calorie diets work is a diverse intake of fibrous vegetables. And so I think a lot of people will say, okay, fibrous vegetables, I got it. But what I would encourage people to do in this scenario is be creative about the variety of fibrous vegetables out there. So people think, okay, spinach, broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, and then the list gets really short. And like that, those are like the main ones that kind of jump out for a lot of people. But think of a variety of different leafy greens that you could go with. Um, and then think out outside the box a little bit, specifically some colorful stuff, uh, squash, pumpkin, beets, things like that. Um, and what you'll find is when you mix and match your, your vegetables, like I'll admit it, I'm not proud of it. I used to eat pumpkin, just like plain pumpkin puree. And it was a very intuitive, uh, slide into that depraved state that I reached. So here's, here's how it started. I would have oatmeal. And then I would put in pumpkin and some Splenda and some cinnamon. And it was like a delicious pumpkin pie oatmeal kind of thing. Started out innocent enough. And that was a delicious thing. I would serve that to a person with normal food standards. And they would like that. Um, but then... Didn't you actually get in trouble for making that in the office? And the other people in the office with you were like, Fuck you, Eric. Your, food's, <laughs> your food smells too good and it's distracting me. No, so what, what happened what, was... What was that? So th this this story was total BS. So I was in a... I was a grad student and we shared an office. It was like 15 people for an office the size of like, the size of like a typical bedroom. You know what I mean? Like it, there was a lot yeah. of people in a small space and there was a microwave and I was on a really restrictive diet and I would like... This isn't good. I'll admit it. I would microwave eggs in there. No, 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 no. No, no, but I, I'm getting to the okay, point you're talking okay. about. So I would microwave eggs in there and people would be like, dude, Eric, it smells disgusting when you microwave eggs in here. It's a small room. Stop doing it. And I should have stopped earlier than I did. I'll admit it. But eventually I was like, all right, fair point. So instead, <laughs> I brought in oatmeal with some, uh, some uh, vanilla protein powder with some cinnamon mixed in. And I made my oatmeal in the microwave, put in the, the powder and the cinnamon, mix it all up. And people had the nerve to get angry at me, they were mad because the egg smelled terrible. And I finally accommodated their request and made that. And then they were upset because it smelled too good. And everyone's like, oh man, I just wish I could have that. You're making me hungry. Could you please stop making that in the office? And at that point, I said, I'm never going to try to appease anyone ever again. <laughs> I, I was so annoyed by that. Yeah, I, I didn't remember the exact story, but I remembered cinnamon was in the mix somewhere. Yeah, the story was I finally accommodated people and said you know what if it makes you happy i'm happy to do it for you and then they still didn't appreciate it, it unbelievable awful. the person who actually got really irritated about that who, who got really annoyed with me is like one of my very good friends so i'm not actually angry but i will admit i never let her live that down because i was like you i can't believe you <laughs> um so anyway uh it started out as a delicious pumpkin oatmeal, which actually was like delicious. And like, that's a pretty solid meal. Keep that in mind if you're listening. Um, but what happened was eventually I was like, man, I can't have this many oats. So the, the oatmeal serving got cut in half. So it was a little bit of oats and a whole bunch of pumpkin puree and, and the cinnamon and all that stuff. And it was, it was still very good. And I don't know, something happened. All, all of a sudden my calories were really low and the oatmeal went from a big amount to a small amount. And then it just kind of disappeared. And uh, eventually I was just eating pumpkin with like a little bit of cinnamon in it. No Splenda? I, th I, I think I actually just didn't even bother with the Splenda. Because I was like, this is, dark. This is really bad anyway. This oh, is a garbage man. meal. So I was just eating pumpkin. I, I don't know how many people listening to this have actually just eaten pum pumpkin puree. Because, like, when people hear pumpkin, they think pumpkin pie. Right, yeah. And they're like, oh, so it basically tastes like that. But, like, obviously it's not quite as sweet. But I think people, for whatever reason, assume that pumpkin is slightly sweet. Maybe because it looks vaguely reminiscent of sweet potatoes. Yeah. It's not. It's like, not. plain pumpkin is disgusting. Well, that, you've gone a little too far. Play, it's fine. It's not good. Yeah, so the the moral of the story is when it comes to getting some fibrous vegetables in the diet be creative about which ones uh, are going to fit 
because the the broader that selection is, the more likely you are to cover your bases in terms of the, the variety of uh, vitamins and minerals that you need in your diet. Um, another thing to keep in mind is, you know, very basic multivitamin mineral supplementation. Um, I'm not big on taking, you know, huge doses of any singular vitamin or mineral uh, with a, a few notable exceptions aside. I don't like to lean too much on a multivitamin, but this is one of those scenarios. I generally take one anyway, um, just because, uh, you know, it, it's a nice little insurance, you know, to just say, ah, I'm sure it'll help me cover my bases. But um, this is another, or this is, I guess, a particular instance where it makes a lot of sense to have that insurance in place and say, I'm going to do my best with my vegetable intake, but if I happen to come up short, then at least I can lean on that multivitamin. You, you seem to be really tickled about something over there. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to butt in, but now that you've given me an invitation, um, anytime someone talks about multivitamins now, I cannot help but think about the old animal pack ads. <laughs> yeah. so, so here's here's just a, a fun thing to do if you know if you're if you're cooped up and want some way to kill some time. If you were in the fitness industry in let's say like 2012, 2013, you undoubtedly saw these advertisements. Yeah. Um if you're <laughs> if you're newer to the game, maybe you haven't and it's worth just googling animal pack ad so the thing is like supplement ads are are often just completely ridiculous but animal pack made multivitamins like you know it wasn't like creatine it wasn't protein it wasn't like one of those supplements that was purporting to be an anabolic when it really just had like a little horny goat weed or whatever but like it was it was just a straight up multivitamin yeah. and from what i understand it was a fine multivitamin but it, it was a fucking multivitamin <laughs> and like they would have all of these ads where it was some dude who was just unbelievably jacked he'd be like sitting on the edge of his bed with his head hung looking deeply depressed in like the rattiest apartment that looks like it was in a building that was already condemned and should have been torn down in 1987 and like the text would be like your life sucks no one understands you you have no friends your family doesn't understand what you do the iron is the only thing that understand that understands you at all take our multivitamin <laughs> like, yeah they, they were dude it's it's like so much about the fitness space tries to be so much more hardcore than it really is. But those animal pack ads from like circa 2010 to 2015 really take the cake for <laughs> like trying to be dark and hardcore to a degree that became a self parody about multivitamins. Like you should really <laughs> look them up. They're they're absolutely incredible. The thing is, like, just from the imagery alone, if you just change the captions, like, it almost looks like it's like a public service announcement that's like, listen, you never know what somebody's going through. Like, <laughs> just just reach out. Just be kind. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it looks like a person who is having the worst moment of their entire life in an image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, buy our multivitamin. <laughs> yeah, or, or like... Um... Or, or, you know, like it, it's it's from an article about toxic masculinity where it's just like, look at this guy. Like, he's obviously trying to compensate for something. <laughs> he's built so much muscle to to try to be like armor against all of the emotional pain he's going through. Like, it's all right. Men can cry too. Like, yeah. if, if you have bro friends and they seem like they're going through something, just give them a hug. Like, like that looks like the kind of image that it is. But it's just like, nope, your life sucks. Take our multivitamin. Yeah, <laughs> like... I just, <laughs> I would love the idea of if you could find someone who is unfamiliar with the concept, right? And you just have like, um, just have the images, no text. Just hold it up and be like, what is this for? <laughs> How many hundreds of thousands of guesses it would take before they thought, I think that's an advertisement for multivitamin. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but uh, okay, so. Um, like I was saying, you're on very low calories. It does make sense to have a little bit of insurance when it comes to falling short of any particular, uh, you know, uh, vitamin or mineral, um, intake. 
But uh, I still, one of the things I fear is when you tell, tell people, oh, just throw a multivitamin in. I think sometimes people overestimate exactly how much of a safety net that is. So I always encourage people when you're on these low calories, you still want to do your absolute best to get the nutrients you need from the diet itself. The supplementation is kind of the icing on the cake. It, it Like I said, it's the insurance policy, but you, you don't get an insurance policy on a car and be like, sweet, I'm just going to bend this thing around a pole. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. treat, treat it like actual insurance, which is, I hope I don't need it, but if I do, it's there. So th that that's what I'm getting at when I say it's a good insurance policy, but still make sure you've got a diverse intake of foods that have abundant uh, micronutrients in them. And then finally, one thing I, I, I do keep in the mix there when calories get low is a fish oil supplement or, or some kind of uh, you know high quality omega-3 supplement. Uh, when your fats start getting super low, you want to have a uh, you want to keep an eye on making sure that you have the right fatty acids coming into your diet. When, when you're bulking and you're eating a ton of fat every day, you don't have to be quite as cautious about it, but you have to get really efficient when it comes to making sure that of the limited fat you're taking in on a given day, are you actually getting decent intakes of the essential fatty acids that your body cannot endogenously produce? So one of the things I often uh, recommend on these low caloric intakes is um, you know, fish oil, not a bad idea because it's a very uh, calorically efficient way to make sure that you're getting some of those essential fatty acids that, that you very much need. So those are the main things I do. Make sure your protein sources are lean. Make sure you've got a, a nice diverse intake of mic micronutrients from the diet. Typically speaking, fibrous vegetables are a great way to make that happen. You can have the insurance policy there with a, a nice, well-formulated multivitamin, and then a little bit of fish oil on top seems to do the trick. Makes sense to me. Do you want to move on to up-and-coming creators? I think that'd be a great idea. Who is the up-and-coming creator this week? All right. So uh, standard caveat that we always put on this segment. Uh, these are people who we've come across some of their content. Uh, they were suggested by you guys to check out. Um, we looked over some of their stuff. It appeared to be good. This does not constitute an endorsement of everything that anyone has ever said or all of their opinions about all topics ever. So that is the standard caveat. Uh, and with that out of the way. And, and so again, I don't mean that in an aggressive way. Like, dude, the person we're shouting out, they have some good content, but boy, are they a piece of shit. That, that, <laughs> that is very much not what we're trying to say. Just that is an important caveat to get out there. It's so hard to do because you're like, you, how do you strike that balance, right? right like, hey, yeah. this seems good. But if there's anything that's not good, that's not what we're talking about. But we don't think there's anything that's not good. They yeah. seem fine. But that's where we're at. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> for, for, this, uh, for this episode, it is Daniel DeBrock. So he is a competitive powerlifter and coach. He puts out content on a site called stackedstrength.com. Uh, and most of his content is specific to powerlifting and strength development. So he was suggested by four or five people on our form. Uh, and again, if you want to shout someone out or, or give us someone to look into, you can do that at tiny.cc slash creators. Um, so yeah, four or five people said, hey, you should check out Daniel. He's putting out good stuff. I was actually already aware of Daniel um, because he submitted an article to our website which I rejected, <laughs> um, not, not because it was a bad article. So one thing just to know about us in general, we, we have really high standards for guest articles that we, that we accept. And so like we turned down about 90% of them. And so if we turned down an article, it's not because it was a bad article. The, the article he submitted was a really good article. It was just, we'd covered a very similar topic on the website before. So I was like, ah. Eh, you know, I'm going to pass on it, but you should definitely submit this elsewhere because it's good work. Um, so I was already aware of Daniel. And in fact, to shout out an article that he's gotten published before, uh, he wrote an article for Kabuki Strength called Optimize Your Recovery for Maximal Strength Gains. And um, it is, dare I say, stronger by science-esque content. Uh, if he would have submitted this to us, I would have published it in a heartbeat. It's like damn near 8,000 words. Very, very in-depth piece on recovery. Um, 
maybe the best free article on just like how to recover from training that I've come across. Um, I, I was aware of a fair amount of the stuff in the article, but it is, it's very impressive for its thoroughness. You should definitely check it out. It's very, very good work. Um, so yeah, and, and the stuff he's putting out on Instagram is high quality. Uh, just skimmed several of the articles on his sites, stack strength, seems to be very good content. Um, so yeah, Daniel, up and coming creator. Um, he's writing for a lot of different sites, seems to be, you know, seems to be really making a name for himself right now. And, uh, he is someone you should check out. Um, his site again is stackstrength.com. If you want to check out his social media, we will put links to that, uh, in the show notes. And if there is someone who you would like us to check out to potentially get a shout out, uh, you can submit them at tiny.cc slash creators. All right, so that just about does it for this episode. We're about out of time, but to play us out, um, people have come to really love our segment on cooking tips and and various ideas uh, for for people who enjoy cooking. Unfortunately, that segment has been very Greg heavy, and I've got a lot of bad feedback about that particular (laughs) aspect of it. Um, I mean, my inbox is a disaster right now. Um, So... In order to accommodate some of those messages, I I figured I would take the reins and do my own um, cooking recipe to play us out. And Greg, back me up. This is an actual good one. This one, have you looked at the recipe? Yeah. Yeah, this one is actually good. So I normally joke around about, you know, for instance, just eating pure pumpkin because who cares? But this is actually a solid recipe. And what's cool about it is the ingredients that go into it all have insanely long shelf life. And so it's one of those things you can just keep the stuff for it around essentially in perpetuity and not have to worry. Like it stresses me out when I buy perishable stuff and it's sitting in my fridge and I'm like, dude, I got to make that in the next like four days. Mm -hmm. Like I now have a task on my to-do list. So you can buy this stuff, leave it in the pantry for as long as you want. And uh, it's always sitting there good to go. And it really does taste good. The macros are solid. This is a really great recipe. So the recipe is for lentil soup. And so you've got lentils, uh, canned tomatoes, vegetable stock. And uh, I was at my grocery store. They have something that's just called soup vegetables. It's like in the frozen section. What What was it? Uh, it's like, uh, like I said, literally, it's, it's in the frozen vegetable section. They just call it soup vegetables, but there's like celery, a little bit of corn, some cut up like potato maybe. Hmm. It's just a bunch of like high-ish fiber vegetables that would go well in a soup. I gotcha. Um, and when they're right, they're right. They, they, they worked in the soup, but basically lentils, canned tomatoes, basically any kind of just generic frozen vegetable, um, vegetable stock. And so here's the thing, this makes, or, or this takes about five minutes to make. You basically, what I do is I put the lentils in, uh, canned tomatoes. I kind of just run the the frozen vegetables under cold water to help them get kind of thawed out quickly and just throw them in. I'm putting all this stuff in the crock pot, by the way. Was that assumed? If I'm talking about it, it was made in a crock pot. (laughs) So if you didn't fill that in already, I'm making it in a crock pot. Um, But basically you throw that stuff in, uh, vegetable stock, you put it in for eight hours on low, you come back at some point later, one to four days later, And you've got to, I'm kidding, come back in in time. Otherwise it'll dry out. You don't want it to dry up. But uh, honestly, really good soup. But here's the thing. First couple times I made it, I did no spices at all. No seasonings of any kind. But did you at least add salt? I I did add salt. Okay. Yeah. I added salt. But man, the flavor was, I guess you could say bland, if we're being honest. I'll admit it. But uh, the last time I made it was actually last night. I put in onion powder, uh, cumin, garlic, salt, and bay leaves. What are bay leaves? Okay, so when you came into the house today, you didn't say, what are bay leaves? I'm going to tell you a little bit. So Trex comes in. He's like, dude, I had some lentil soup, or I made some lentil soup. It was really good. I put some spices in. Have you heard of cumin? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh... I mean, that that may or may not land with some people. Uh, cumin is, is a very common spice. 
Um, I, I was under the impression that I had found a hidden gem in the grocery store. Sure. But yeah, so cumin. We, we, we can go with that. Pretty good. But what, what, the, what are bay leaves? It's, I just put a leaf in there. Does that really change the flavor? So bay, was it a dried bay leaf or was it a fresh bay leaf? I think it was dry. Okay. So this, this is a controversial opinion. Uh-oh. I am of the opinion that dry bay leaves are completely inert and don't do anything. Okay. But yeah. if you have like some leaves in there, people are like, oh, they got fancy with, with how they were flavoring this thing. Yeah. Um, if you go to a store that has like fresh bay leaves, you can like, you can smell them kind of like scratch them and like sniff the oil. That is the flavor that they're supposed to impart. And like fresh bay leaves do add a nice distinctive flavor to stews or stocks. Yeah. Um, but I, I am firmly of the opinion that dry bay leaves do literally nothing. Yeah. So I think, it, I think I did a cup of lentils, uh, one can of just diced tomatoes, one thing of frozen soup vegetables, and then, uh, 16 ounces of vegetable stock, fluid ounces, and then 16 fluid ounces of water, uh, threw a bunch of spices in there, figured out cumin is a thing. Also leaves, with, which may or may not have flavor. <laughs> Put it in low eight hours. Honest to God, it, it tastes really good. The macros are fantastic. And like I said, it, it's the kind of stuff with really long shelf life that you buy the stuff and, you know, one day you feel like soup. It's all sitting there. It takes 10 minutes. Sounds good. Okay. I think that does it for today's episode. In the weeks to come, we are going to have a variety of episodes coming out. Some are going to be fireside chats others are going to be more typical on-topic episodes as always thank you for listening and we'll be back soon thanks for listening to the stronger by science podcast now greg and i are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter so before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional if you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it Visit StrongerByScience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.